from the first movie you did to right now, like how was the process and how did you find your essence and your style in your filmmaking? Um, so from the, f the first films I started making, the process yeah. um, sort of, uh, it kind of dictated how the films were made. Okay. Um, and also the technology, because um, we were, you know, I started making films when there a lot of digital technology was becoming available. Okay. And uh, that made it just very easy to shoot films, whereas before it was like, you know, everything had to be shot on 35 millimeter, requiring huge crews, yeah. um, large expenditures on the film. And then all of a sudden we were able to shoot with these, you know, small lightweight cameras yeah. that were just purely digital. And that really liberated us to make films that maybe, say, in Hollywood were sort of being suppressed. Yeah. Uh, there were a lot of films being made in the 70s that were brilliant. Yeah. Uh, but the studios were just crushing them because they didn't, they weren't, they either weren't profitable or they were just too artistic. Yeah. Uh, films like, like Hal Hartley, or not Hal Hartley, Hal Ashby, Easy Rider. Yeah. Um, stuff like that, Dennis Hopper's movies, things like that. A lot of that stuff was starting to get crushed. And so my thought was, if we're able to shoot quickly and it's not too expensive yeah. and we don't need gigantic crews, can we sort of pick up where those guys left off? Yeah. And kind of like rescue the cinema. Yeah. Okay. In a way, like sort of rest save the cinema. All right. Um, and, uh, that was sort of like how the process of of making those films developed and and because i got involved in that process i feel like my films have gotten like more authentic yeah. like it's about being making the films increasingly authentic rather than going in this direction of making them more conventional reality interests me less than truth that's why i take pictures I took this picture inside a dream. My body was gone. All my organs were one. I was made of stars. My body was made of stars. In your films, there's sometimes there's like digital camera, but there's also film camera, like you're yeah. mixing stuff, right? Yeah, but I mean, even when we're shooting with film, like it's a lot easier now, you know? Yeah. Like say we've shot a lot of stuff. I mean, I've shot some stuff on 35 as well. Yeah. And we like color correction, for example, yeah. on 35 now, you can just do it yourself it used to be something that you'd have to pay you'd have a you need like a huge part of your budget hundreds of thousands of dollars to get your film color time yeah they would like dip the film in like different chemical baths and now it's like we can just do it on our own mm -hmm. uh edit in like a computer you don't need like a flatbed steam bag or yeah. anything like that so so even filming on film yeah. is a lot easier to do right now so like yeah that's why i'll like bring like film elements into it um, because it's just it's still like way easier to do it now than yeah. it was back in the day okay mm -hmm. and so is it like also because in your movies there's a lot of different actors there's a lot of different people and so is yeah. it more like um like first of all do you like like working with so many different people on yeah. like, one film and how does it inspire you as a filmmaker well, I mean, I as much as possible, I like to bring back people on my films. Yeah. Uh, kind of like try and build a company. Okay. Sort of like Fassbinder, the German director. Okay, yeah. He would always bring back the same actors over and over again. A lot of his actors only appeared in his films for a very long time. Yeah. Mm, Wes Anderson, yeah. he brings back the same actors. Jason Schwartzman is all his movies, you know what I mean? Yeah. So Godot also. Like there's a lot of Godot Anna Karina was yeah, in like all yeah. yep. 
for a very long time. So like I try to bring back people as much as possible. Yeah. And I've had a few actors who they've appeared in more more than one of my films. Is it not like um, a particularity of like independent filmmaking where you just, you just have to um, find some intimacy with the film uh, as an audience also, but as the one who directed uh, it's like very particular from the indie movie, right? Like in indie filmmaking. Like, what about indie filmmaking from your point of view? Why is it important for? Well, I mean, yeah, it's it's it is important. If the whole like independent filmmaking world has changed so much over the years. Yeah. Uh, in the United States right now, independent filmmaking is very uh, run by companies. Okay. It's so really not that independent anymore. Okay. It was independent in the 90s and in the 80s and stuff like that, but now it's very... So I'm not really sure where that spirit of independent film yeah. has gone or like where it's... I think it's alive in my work for sure, but that's because I'm very autonomous. Yeah. And I just sort of like work on my own and I determine what projects I want to do and I just green light them. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, they're successful because they fill a need. Okay. The films I make are like the types of movies that nobody's allowed to make yeah. in the industry. Like if you tried to pitch a movie like the types of movies I want to make, a lot of studios would be like, well, we can't do that for some reason or another. It may just yeah. be like uh, profits and the bottom line yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, or maybe the content. The content is just too, too crazy. There's like a tradition in the cinema. Yeah. And I think it's important to continue that tradition. Like, I don't really think of filmmaking as a competitive thing. Yeah. I think of it more as, like, a, a thing that we make contributions to. Like, there's, like, this body of cinema. And a f director just makes a movie and they just contribute a film to that body of cinema. To get back to your work, like, there's a lot of music in it. Like, there's a lot of, like... Um, like from what I saw, what is your like relationship when you're like uh, writing a movie? Do you have like a precise idea of the music? No, it's not you... really. I mean, usually I do, but then it's like it's that same thing where like um, the movie sort of tells you what to do. Yeah. Okay. Like on hallucinations, I was talking to all of these like pop artists. Yeah. And like on Thrashers, I licensed a ton of music from bands, shoegaze bands, and it was a very slick. Uh, produced sound to the soundtrack. I moved to Los Angeles to become the great American novelist. And you know what I became instead? The great American failure. I'd love to read it. I'd love to. What? This is what it feels like to understand everything is beautiful. But then once I finished Hallucinations, it was such a strange movie yeah. that when I thought about putting conventional music over it, it just it didn't, didn't feel right. And so I ended up using a lot of my own music, um, which is very lo-fi and really disorienting sometimes. And that felt more, a lot of it was recorded on tape, four track tape. And uh, that felt a lot more natural for the film. But also the other thing about music that's interesting was I spent many years in the music industry yeah. and it's a really different industry than the film industry. Yeah. Um, people are way more artistic and they're way more, I mean, think about being a musician. Your job is basically to sit around all day and feel feelings yeah. and then just like translate them into music, you know? And I feel like when filmmakers sit down, they're thinking, well, what's going to make money? What's going to be popular? Yeah. what's what's cool yeah it's like a totally different perspective yeah. and I feel like because I have so much training in the music industry yeah. I have this idea of making films where I want filmmakers who are artists yeah. like I want filmmakers who are a bit more like a rock star a bit more edgy yeah. um, a bit more authentic um, less sort of like an executive uh, businessman yeah. or okay. type of person you yeah. know what I mean and I think that that's like the main way that like music has really influenced my films is uh, coming from a place of authenticity and risk-taking yeah um, 
Yeah. yeah. So one thing we were talking about is you have a background in um, theater and you also have done a lot of work with adaptation. Yeah. So what is that like coming from... I mean, first of all, I'm just interested in that because in the United States, we don't have that as much where people are interested in like theater, literary adaptation. It goes into like this other area. It's yeah. like the merchant ivory uh, costume historical drama. It's a very specific yeah. thing. It doesn't get done very often. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what drew you to that? What drew you to like, instead of going in a more commercial yeah. direction what drew you to sort of doing more ad literary adaptation and stuff I, like that i think it's because i have like a, my like my training was very much like classical theater and because of that i think um it's it's it almost feel familiar like there is something very familiar to adaptation and um those um like those characters from theater that were trying mm -hmm. to adapt into um, cinema, like uh, in audiovisual work. And what I really like about it is, and I think it's like what I'm trying to do with when I'm acting um, those character is um, it's intemporal. Like the feelings, like the costumes are different and the time is different, but actually the feelings don't change. Like from mm. like the prehistorical to right now, like the feelings don't change. So I think it's really interesting to uh, even with the words because the words are different in you know in the 1900 uh, and now it's very different like words and we're not speaking the same way that's true but what i really like is that with this challenge of words you can make it um understandable for an audience just by the way you're doing it like just by the emotion you're putting behind it mm -hmm. and i think it's like what i really like it's compromise de la façon la plus révoltante et avec un soldat encore. Je sais ce que tu vas me dire. Je me suis fait plotter. Ah, t'es plus bête qu'un troupeau d'oie. Tu dis des bêtises. Je leur ferai une éducation, moi, ce monsieur. Mais oui, mais oui. <rire> Je t'en prie, laisse-moi rire. <rire> C'est trop drôle. I think it's really interesting for people to just have like um uh like something that's uh like to make the work known. You know, like literature work. You know? Yeah, yeah exactly. like yeah. I think a lot of time, like there's a lot of people who are discovering an author because of the film. Like it happens mm -hmm. a lot. Like they're discovering mm -hmm. it, uh, like in mm -hmm. uh, a novel, like watching the film. Then they read the f and then they read the novel, and then they are interested in the in the author. So I think also that um, cinema and audiovisual work have this mission in a way. Like it's a uh, it's a good way to make people know things like mm -hmm. you know it's very interesting i think the cinema is is the cinema inherently commercial you know what i mean is yeah. it an inherently commercial thing because I, I i'm thinking back to like the first french i think it was in france the first like experiments with cinema where there's like yeah. that story of like they would show people the people who saw like the first movie Lumière, um, I think it was the Lumiere brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah the like they the they movie. filmed a train, yeah. and people like ran out of oh. the theater because yeah. they were afraid they couldn't tell that it wasn't a real train. Yeah. So I still feel like at the heart of cinema, there's something about perception going on, you know. And then if it ends up being commercial, then great. Well, commercial, what but that's mean, not... like you know what I mean. Like, I mean it's popular actually. Yeah. You know, commercial means it's popular. It's something yeah. that. Is going to people are going to enjoy it. Like a lot of people are going to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about commercial in a bad way, but actually it means that the art is popular and a lot of people enjoy it. What about theory in like filmmaking? Well, I mean, I think it's we were talking about it a little bit earlier, but it's something that I keep wanting to like get into is this idea that um, when you're making a film and there's a lot of people on set and there's a lot of rules and there's a lot of uh there's just a lot of noise and requirements mm -hmm. it sort of gets in the way of the artistic and creative process and so i'm fascinated by like on the films that i've made where i've had the largest crew mm -hmm. those have been the most limited productions where we were able to do the least 
And when I was working either alone or with just one other person, or a lot of the shoots we did in LA, for example, it would just be me and two actors. Like if there were two other actors, if there were two actors in the scene, it would just be like, I would just be filming mm -hmm. and we would have like some sort of setup for the sound. There'd be no sound guy or anything like that. And so there was this total focus on what the movie was. Mm -hmm. And there was no sort of like, okay, we need to like, uh, I've had a lot of movies where it's like, like I think I was telling you about this the other week in Paris. We'll, I'll get an actress like totally ready for a shot and then someone on the crew will be like, oh, there's a problem yeah. with the lights or the sound or something like that. Yeah. And so I'm very interested in this idea of like simplifying processes. Yeah. And I think there's like a theory behind it. And I think that once we get into that theory, we're able to do films that are like really unconventional. Okay, what, what kind of theory are we talking about? Like, what kind of I've sort of, well, I mean, I've been influenced by a lot of different, like, um, philosophies, yeah. you know? But I have my own theory called counter-structuralism, uh, which is sort of like a takeoff from the post-structuralist theorists, like Foucault, okay. uh, and uh, various people like that, Deleuze and Guattari, French post-structuralists. Um, and it's about, um, you know, films can get very structured. Yeah. You want to make a spy thriller or a romantic comedy. There's, it's almost like making a dress. You have a pattern. Yeah. And you just cut it to that pattern. That's one I'm to yeah. There you go. If we're able to shoot a lot more nimbly, like if we're a lot more nimble, we have small equipment like here in this room we're shooting we have like a ton of cameras here but the cameras are tiny right yeah uh, so if we're able to but the quality is high yeah so we're sort of able to match that old like lawrence of arabia 65 yeah. millimeter look but we're able to do it with like a digital camera mm. so then what that also means that one of the big problems with filmmaking is how much money is being spent on the film you get really nervous about how much money is being spent on a film. My first film that I financed, I was working two jobs at the same time. Yeah. I was working full time as an editor, and then I would come home at night, there'd be an hour where I got to eat dinner, and then probably at around 7 p.m. I would start editing my film. Mm. And I would edit my film until around 1 a.m. or 2 a.m., yeah. and then I would wake up the next day again at 7 a.m., and I would go back, and I would work another full day of editing, and I was doing this, and not only was I doing that, we were also trying to get the film ready for festival deadlines. Mm -hmm. So we had a deadline on the film as well. Okay. Like making a movie is hard work, and you're up against something. You're up against, like we were talking about, like in acting there's like some degree of mystery. Yeah. You're like up against that. And I feel like in my films, I'm always trying to preserve that line. Yeah. Like I don't want people to kill that line. I don't want people to like, totally be able to go like obviously I want people to feel safe on my sets yeah. and I want people to feel the I think like the most important thing on my sets is that people feel that they can do what they want to do artistically yeah like if anything gets in the way of that then that we don't want that you know but, that, but then you can see like why I'm fascinated by method acting because if, if yeah. an actor comes on set and they're like I'm a method actor it's like are they not allowed to use their method on the set? Or, like you were saying, do we just have a conversation with the cast where it's like, okay, so this person's a method actor. Yeah, I think when the important. camera turns off, yes. they're not going to stop oh, yeah. being the character. Yeah. Um, so just give them some space. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, I just don't want to, I don't want to lose that culture. Yeah. And, and I, I'm happy here in France, and I like it here in Europe, because I feel like here... There still is a cinema culture, and there, there still is culture. Because when I decided I wanted to be a director, one of the things I did to train myself was act a lot. I do a lot of theater. Mm -hmm. uh, I did some random stuff, video games, mm -hmm. voice acting, yeah. uh, TV, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And what I found out, but I had no pressure on me, because I knew yeah. I wanted to be a director. Yeah. So, you so I was, yeah, I was just doing it to figure out how actors tick. Mm. Like, how does an actor work? How does an actor's brain work? Mm. And what I found out from it is that it's a really mysterious process. Mm. And so when I work with actors, I'm just really like, I don't ask them too much about their private lives. Mm. 
and I don't get too involved with them, which can be confusing for actors sometimes. A lot of the actors who I've worked with are sort of like, Michael, why aren't you like, why aren't we getting lunch all the time? Yeah. Why aren't you at, like texting me at midnight? Yeah. I'm just like, because at midnight, I don't know what you're up to. Like yeah. for the tomorrow's shoot, yeah. you may be doing some really weird shit. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Like do you, you know, like I don't want to know like what you have to do to make your performance happen. I'm not sure about this process, but anyway, and I, I think like in, in Europe in general, method acting is actually less uh, done because it's very like, um, there, there's a lot of uh, acting method, it's, it's much more like classical method. You know uh -huh. what I mean? Like British people, for example, are very known for the uh, like the classical method. Uh -huh. You're doing a lot of Shakespeare. You're doing a lot of like those very classical author. And if you're able to say Shakespeare, you're able to play everything. You know, for example, okay, like it, it, this kind of perspective, sure, uh, where you have to just train on the like the the hard material. Before, and, and if you like good at the hard material, like you can do like whatever you want. Right. Um, and so method acting, I think for huh. me. I think it's it's just interesting to mix the method. Yeah. Because sometimes you have characters, or as you said, you know, for example, with you, you're not uh, doing rehearsals, and maybe yeah. it's it depends on the project and it depends on the director. And so right. you're kind of like if you learn different method, mm -hmm. you can just like use a little bit of all of them uh, in a project. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So because for example, like when I, I work with other actors. As I said earlier, there are there are uh, actors that are much more uh, intellectual. Other, they are much more um, instinct, like instinct-based, like acting. Um, other are much more like in, in, like they they are inward, and other right, are like outward, yeah. yeah, introverted, extroverted. This depends on on the people. But I think what which is really interesting is like when you're mixing everything. Right. Like it's like you can communicate also with the other actor. Mm -hmm. Communicate with the director. Communicate with your character. Mm -hmm. Like there's, uh, I think it's it. The thing is, when you're a young actor, a lot of time you choose your method to begin with. Like you choose a method actor, uh, mm -hmm. method sorry, method acting for example, or classical uh, theater, or you're just choosing your method to begin with. But the more you grow, and the more you're like, oh, but I want to grab a little bit of this, grab a little bit of, mm -hmm. bit of that. And I think at the end of the day, you're just doing your own salad. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I think like um, all actors are using every kind of method. Right. You know, even if there's a principal method, but they're just like using a little bit of everything in order to make their own way that is working for them. Right. That's interesting, yeah. Well, I mean, the camera gets turned off in between yeah. takes. So, I mean, theoretically, someone doesn't have to stay mm. um, the villain in between takes. But it, it's just interesting to me because it's... it's And it's it was a method that's been used over many years. You yeah. know, it's like it's been like something that's been used for, I think, since the 60s or the 50s. Yeah. It was a very popular, like, method of yeah. acting. Um, and so it's, like, strange to see it go away. This is the mystery of filmmaking. Uh, the films have an intelligence and a life and a spirit of their own. They'll tell, like, the film will tell you whether it wants to be made or not. Yeah. I mean, I have so many unproduced screenplays and I've produced so many films where we got right up to the point of producing the movie and then something, just like some intuition or something like that, I just knew it wasn't working out. It could be in a, a in a sign, or we didn't find all the actors we needed, or something just doesn't feel right. And so the movie will tell you itself yeah. whether it wants to be made or not. Mm -hmm. Hallucinations was almost a scary movie to make because it just kept happening. Mm -hmm. Like I would, I, one of my actresses, she was from Germany, and she was like, "I'm only in town for two weeks. Can we shoot?" And I was like, "Yeah, let's start shooting." And she just showed up, and she just did everything, Laurie. She just did everything. Mm -hmm. And and I couldn't even stop it. Yeah. Like, even if I wanted to stop her and be like, can we please go slower? There was no stopping it. Yeah. We would roll the cameras, perfect take, done, in the can. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, and it just kept going like that. Mm. And then some days I would be done shooting and I would be so exhausted that I couldn't shoot for like four days. Yeah. Like my feet were bleeding <laughs> or something like that because it was just so hard. Mm. And 
and then I would call the actors a couple of days later and be like, hey, I don't have to talk to you like for four days or something, but do you want to show up and shoot more? And they're like, yeah. 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 And it, was just, it just kept happening. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's a good sign when you're making a movie. Yeah. Like it wants to make itself. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and being very detached, I think, is important as well. Because like in all of my screenplays up till now, I'm thinking of, uh, at some point of publishing the screenplays because there's usually huge stretches of the screenplay mm. that we didn't film. Yeah. Um, we would film it. Sometimes we don't film it. Sometimes we do film it. And it just doesn't work. Mm. Like it's just not good or something like that. Yeah. Like Hallucinations was sort of supposed to be a comedy. But it ended up being like a kind of spooky, surrealist movie with themes of trauma. Yeah. That yeah. was not my plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was not my plan at all. That was not what I was trying to make. I can remember sitting at the editing bay and thinking, wow, this movie is really different than what uh, I... Yeah. And that's like the big myth of directing that I kind of like... Yeah. I'm like kind of getting over right now is this, this idea that like directors are in control of everything. Yeah. And like for actors we can puppeteer the actor. It's just not true. Mm. There's yeah. just, there's so many variables flying around yeah. at the same time. And at best, you're just like sort of guiding it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And also being passive yeah. in a sense to a degree and being like a servant to the film itself. And so, and it's like almost like, what do you need? What do, what does the film need? Yeah. And making sure you're providing that for the film. Yeah. Um, so it's, and we can do that, especially when we're working in like simplified, more free context. Yeah. And there's not a lot of, getting back to the counter structure yeah. thing, there's not a lot of structure. What are you trying to experience during a movie? And what are you trying to make other people experience? I mean, with the, with the audience, like it's always a different thing. Like with Thrashers, I know I just wanted to make a traditional art house film with a really banging soundtrack. Because mm -hmm. that was something that was always missing. Like I watched like a Godard film or like an Agnes Varda film, and they were great, but they didn't have like a really strong soundtrack. Yeah. So I just wanted to do that. Mm. Like it's like very simple. Yeah. But then like Hallucinations was a film where like I actually wanted people to have like an altered state of consciousness while yeah. they were watching it, and we had a theatrical premiere in Los Angeles. And I was pretty nervous because it's a pretty challenging movie. Yeah. But I sat through the whole movie with a theater full of people mm -hmm. and afterwards when the movie was over and the lights came up everybody really was in this like totally different vibe yeah and I was sort of like wow it worked uh, yeah. okay cool I didn't really expect that but it, it did work so there's always a different um, purpose for each film yeah mm -hmm. And these last few years of making films where I'm not compromising and I'm doing exactly what I want, it's, it's felt a lot less like that. Yeah. It's felt a lot more like a joy and it's felt a lot more like there's a sense of purpose. Yeah. You know, um, and those are all super positive to me, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah. Pain. Passion, when you say, you know, for example, yeah. passion of the Christ, right, right, right. because he has pain. like a pain equal passion. Like, so if, you're, if you yeah. don't do it, it's more painful. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. yes. I mean, it's like, it's don't, it's more Yeah, painful. I was just going to say it makes life make sense. Yeah. It's almost like, I mean, when we, because when we make a film, it, there's this weird access to another reality. And um, without access to that reality, life can be a little strange sometimes. Yeah. Like when we when we write a screenplay and we're all like we're going to produce this screenplay. Yeah. And you're going to play this role mm. and your mind is going to go into that role and we're going to set up this camera and we're going to create a shot that almost looks more beautiful than reality. Yeah. There's just something that adds something back to my existence that isn't normally there. It's missing. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So there's something very necessary to making a film. I think we're finished. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Cassia. So grateful for this. Yeah, grateful for that too. Okay. Conversation. Okay. Oh, the camera? Oh, no, just the whole thing. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good.